laughing. <laughs> it's okay. Save your applause. We're going to be doing the chain introductions today where one person introduces the other. Um, thank you. Thank you for being here. This is a wonderful turnout and we're really happy you guys are here tonight. Um, so this is our first talk in the Voices from the Vault series in spring of, of 2020. Uh, we created this series um, last fall in 2019 um, in order to bring, to bring in speakers who can offer insights and help us understand better the riches found in the Ulrich uh, permanent collection which I'm delighted to tell you all is in a matter of weeks going to be uh, completely accessible and searchable on an online portal so that all of you and all of us, I mean, we already have access to it, but, <laughs> but all of you will be able to go online and see for yourselves what amazing things we have in the vault. Um, Tonight, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Kevin Lagranger, whom we invited so that he might give us all a much broader um, temporally and conceptually um, context for thinking about representations of technology in the work of Lee Adler, which we see all around us in this exhibition. Kevin is a professor in the English department at the New York Institute of Technology, where he specializes in the intersections between technology and culture. He's also a fellow at, of the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technology, an international think tank, and a co-founder of the New York Post Human Research Group. Uh, Kevin has written numerous articles and conference presentations on digital culture, artificial intelligence and ethics, and literature and science. His publications have appeared in journals such as Computers and Texts, Computers and the Humanities, and Science Fiction Studies. Um, he has also published on artificial intelligence, society, and ethics in popular publications such as USA Today. His 2013 book, Artificial Slaves, um, was about the pre-modern cultural history of artificial intelligence. Uh, Kevin was telling me today how many languages he learned in part to be able to write that book, which is a lot, <laughs> like all the romance languages. Um, and it's foreshadowing of today's technology, and that book was awarded the 2014 Science Fiction and Techno Techniculture Studies Prize. His latest book, co-edited with James Hughes, was published in 2017 and is titled Surviving the Machine Age, Intelligent Technology and the Transformation of Human Work. It focuses on the future of AI's displacement of human workers and how to meet this challenge. Hopefully you're seeing why we invited Kevin. It seemed like his research is singularly relevant to the concerns that Lee Adler had in the 1960s and 70s. Among his current projects, he and his colleague John Mysack are developing an augmented reality game to help students understand Shakespeare and his world. So in the Q&A, feel free to ask about that. Uh, before I hand the podium over to Kevin, I just want to make sure to thank Ron and Lee Starkle, where are they? There they are. Um, and Humanities Kansas for their support for the Voices from the Vault series. And I also, because this talk is so intimately connected to the exhibition, want to make sure to thank the supporters for this exhibition. Thank you to Lee and Ron again. Uh, Keith and Georgia Stevens, who I know I saw in the, there they are. Oh, they're there. <laughs> uh, Ruben Saunders of Ruben Saunders Gallery. And a special thank you to Derek Adler and Noreen Weiss, who are both um, supporters and lenders to this exhibition. Um, the work they lent from their private collection, I think, really um, contributed to making it um, a full retrospective um, of uh, Derek's father's work. So without that, with that and without further ado, I want to hand the podium over to Kevin. Hi, everybody. Um, I think there's been enough introducing of me. So uh, <clears throat> first, let me thank the Ulrich Museum and everybody connected with it for their kind invitation to me to talk tonight. I'm very happy to be here. I shrank my title to get it on the slide. So honey, I shrunk the title. Um, it's Lee Adler Harbinger of the Post-Human Age. I'll talk about what the heck post-human means in just a minute. So what I'm going to talk about over the next 35, 40 minutes is um, first I'm going to talk about the present merging of human and machine that's happening in our age today. Uh, and then what 
futurists think is uh, going to be coming down the pike in the future, and then ask some questions that people are preoccupied with, including Ad Lee, Lee Adler himself, about our particular dependency on, on uh, machines. And in particular, I'm going to talk about social robots, because that's the newest thing. And some other questions that come up as well. Um, then I'm going to backtrack to how today's artists um, reflect this cultural phenomenon and how previous cultural reflections by artists um, uh, fit, fit with the cultural milieu of their time and anticipate ours. And in, in that light, I'm then going to talk about Lee Adler and some of his work that's here today. So some two key terms that I should define right off the bat. One of them is transhumanism, uh, transhumanism and transhumanists. Transhumanists believe we should use any and all methods um, available to us via science to improve our species, basically to control our own evolution. And in fact, um, maybe a lot of you haven't heard of transhumanists, but they're a pretty rising force in the world today. There's even a transhumanist party in the United States, and there's a, there's a presidential candidate from the transhumanist party and a vice presidential candidate. And their main objectives are to uh, make America more friendly to self-evolution. So the end point that they picture for all of us is the post-human. <clears throat> the post-human is just a new species, a subspecies of us, that would happen in the future if we modified ourselves with technology, pharmaceuticals, and um, surgery so that we could become more robust as a species. So let's talk about just how saturated with technology we are. You can see on the chart here behind me, it shows the 21st century, um, sorry, supply of personal robots over the last uh, about six years or so. It goes from 2013 to 2016, but you can see there's a huge jump in the um, supply of personal robots. And by personal robots, they mean robots you'd use in your household. Like I have, how many of you have a Roomba vacuum cleaner, a robotic vacuum cleaner? Not many, I have two of them. <laughs> they're, they're really great for cleaning up cat litter. Um, uh, and I also have, I mean, many of us don't think of the AI robots in our households, but how many of you have a, uh, an, um, a digital therm thermostat in your house? There's one called a Nest, you can program it. That is another personal AI or robot. Another one that I use is the Ring doorbell. How many people have one of those? Yeah, it's great. It's great for the paranoid. You can see people at your door on your, on your iPhone, and uh, I can also see people who come to my door even when I'm here in Wichita because it pings me. Um, so I've raised my paranoia quite a bit. <clears throat> also, the world supply of industrial robots has jumped a huge amount in the last few years. It's gone up an average of 15% per year. Um, since, 19, for, uh, since 2014, excuse me. But the posthuman is more than just technology. So the age that we live in now is about the merging of humans and their technology. So here's what I mean. Here's a couple of examples of machines. It goes both ways. Machines have become more and more, have integrated more and more human functions or even appearances. And humans in turn have um, incorporated more machinic uh, technology. Here's an example of machines integrating lifelike or human functionalities. This is a bionic bartender on the screen here, and they have these on Royal Caribbean cruises. It's two, basically two robotic arms. <clears throat> they, they make drinks by combining the liquors above them, which they can push up and get doses of into a glass, with mixers which are behind them, and then they shake in a shaker the uh, concoction, and they put it in a glass and slide it down, slide it down those, um, those slots there that, that, that go to the, the, the bar patrons on the, on the cruise ship. There's also similar robot, two, a two-armed robot, just two arms, um, that, that runs, these are the chefs at robot ramen restaurants in Japan. There's a whole chain of these. Um, they're kind of like fast food, one, one arm makes the soup and the other arm um, 
makes the other ingredients, the noodles and the spices, and they put them together, S again, slide it down a slot to a human um, waiter or waitress, and that person delivers the food and collects the money. And in the meantime, there's all these robots are very clearly apparent behind a plexiglass wall, so people can watch them, kind of like a Disneyland display, while they wait for their food. Now, let's go to some more mundane things. I'm sure all of you are probably familiar with automotive um, technology in the factories. This is an assembly line you see up front. There's not one single human being in this picture. They're all robot arms in a line of cars. There is actually one human, you can barely see him, standing among the arms of those robots. And then there's also this robot, um, which is called the Prospero robot. This is a farming robot um, used in Japan. It does everything a farmer does. In fact, two years ago, Japan started a whole farm um, that's run only by these robots. And then the, you can see vehicles in the background. Those are also automatic, uh, self-autonomous vehicles that are run um, by programming. They've also, uh, some machines have taken on a humanoid form, not just functions. The past ones I just talked about mainly were humanoid in their functionality. Here's an example, of the, this is called the Baxter robot that you see on the screen. It looks kind of like the robot in Lost in Space from the 1960s. Two big arms and, and a face that is basically, is really an iPad with a couple of eyes on it, <clears throat> implanted on the robot's head. And um, the eyes are important, as, as is the tablet, because the eyes move um, and look at you, because it's meant to be used side by side with humans on, um, on conveyor belts, you know, as, as, so humans work next to it. And it warns them what it's about to do with its eyes and with the color on the screen. And it's very easy to program. Um, the humans working next to it can program it by simply moving it, pressing a button on its arm. You can see the buttons on its arm. And then moving the robot's arms to show it what they want it to do, and then pressing the button again to enter the series of movements. It's, uh, by the way, the robot costs around $35,000. It's made by a company called um, Rethink Robotics, run by the man I just put on the screen, who's Rodney Brooks. He's an MIT scientist. Here's some things that Baxter can do. It, here, this picture shows Baxter um, sorting things on an assembly line. And this Baxter robot is loading things, in, packing things into uh, crates from an assembly line. And this one's doing the same thing with slightly different shaped um, things. And this one is folding a t-shirt. Now, <laughs> I don't know why we need robots to fold our t-shirts, but if you were to watch this on YouTube, it's painfully slow. So the robot can do it, but you wouldn't want a robot to fold all your t-shirts. It would take all day. So there's some improvements needed. But it's coming down the line. Pretty soon we'll have robots to do daily chores. I already have a robot to vacuum my basement floor. So now, on the other hand, humans have integrated machinic functionalities and AI functionalities. So let me give some examples. This one on the screen is a picture of a guy wearing a robotic, or what's called a bionic glove. And it's invented, it was developed by NASA in, in conjunction with General Motors. And what it's used for is to support um, a worker on an assembly line using a tool in repetitive motion so that they don't get repetitive stress injuries because the bionic arm helps to do that repetitive motion. <clears throat> and to go to things that are not so physical but more mental, there is a prototype called Neuralace, and this, this name, by the way, is picked by Elon Musk, not the developers of the um, prototype. The, uh, this prototype was developed by um, Charles Lieber at Harvard and his team, and Charles Lieber is a neuroscientist. What it is is a very fine mesh each strand of this mesh is thinner than a human hair. So it's thin enough and flexible enough to roll up, put in a syringe, and inject into a human. And that's what you see here is the tip of a syringe with the mesh coming out the tip of it. 
Now, they haven't tried actually injecting it yet, but they have put it surgically into monkeys and rats. And what it does is it's a implantable Wi-Fi antenna. So they implant a Wi-Fi antenna in your brain. And um, it travels to the, if they inject it in the carotid artery, it would travel to the brain, unfold there. Um, they find that there are no side effects and it takes about two weeks. Once it's in, they can communicate from the brain of the animal with the Wi-Fi antenna inside to external digital devices. Now, what this is developed for is for people with Parkinson's and uh, with epilepsy, with severe epilepsy, who have such bad tremors or such, uh, so many, so, such numerous um, uh, seizures that they can't function. So right now, they already have these sort of uh, brain um, uh, pacemakers. They, they implant in the brains of people with these problems, and, but the problem is there's wires coming out of their head going to the box that the computer that controls the pacemakers. Well, the idea of Lieber and his team is you take away all the wires so that people can have a more normal life. Elon Musk's idea, he's thrilled about this, and he started, he was so excited about this, he called it neural lace. I call it neural mesh. The scientists just call it an invention. And, and what, he, what he wants to do is he pictures all of us with available Wi-Fi implants in our brains that we just inject on in our crowded artery, it goes to our brain, and then we have Wi-Fi, and we can connect directly to the internet and think and operate as fast as, as a computer so that we can compete. His, his worry is that we will not be able to compete with AI and, and robots in the near future for jobs unless we do something like this. And I sort of agree with him on that. My last book was about this. Um, However, there are problems. Um, he, there are some practical problems with this that the scientists yet to work, have yet to work out. There are some ethical problems, for instance, and I'll talk about later more, um, but one of them is who gets this? Let's say you can get an implant in your brain and it makes you smarter, faster, and uh, quicker thinker, and by the way, able to communicate tele telepathically be without opening your mouth because you can simply think, transmit the signals to a computer which transmits it to your partner wirelessly. Um, well, who gets it? If not everybody gets it, then you create a superhuman race that have super brain power and then everybody else. Um, so he, he's excited enough. He, he invested $100 million of his own money three years ago to start a corporation called Neuralink that's trying to develop this kind of thing. Another um, enhancement of the brain um, is being developed by Theodore Berger, who's a neuroengineer, and his team at USC in Southern California. What he's come up with is a prosthetic memory chip. He's found a way to code memories from the hippocampus, which is where your short-term memories are seated, onto a chip, and then store that chip away. And this is for people with Alzheimer's. He pictures that as people's hippocampus degenerates when you have Alzheimer's, he simply stores the memories first, and then as people lose functionality in the hippocampus, he implants the chips back in where the memories were seated before. And he's tried this again. He's done a prototype of this on animals, and it works perfectly. Um, he has taught rats to run a maze, stored it on a chip, cut out the part of the hippocampus where the memory was stored, the rats can't run the maze, then he puts the chip in, and the rats are on the maze. Um, also, another thing that's possibly a little scary is he's taken the chips from one rat and put them into another rat's head, and the rat can run a maze that's never seen the maze before. So he, the implication is he could give us all fake memories if we so desire, or maybe if we don't desire. Some other things that are already in prototype. This is Bertolt Meyer on the screen holding a tennis ball with his digital um, prosthetic hand. It's the mo one of the most advanced digital prosthetic hands in the world. Um, he's Swiss, I believe, and he's trying to show how delicate the touch, sense of touch is with this hand by just squeezing the tennis ball a little bit with two fingers. Old hands, you couldn't control the, the force of the contracture of the hand and it could be problematic. Here's an um, Occumetrics prototype of a um, bionic cornea, or um, it's sort of like a hard 
contact lens, has a chip in it. It magnifies, amplifies your vision threefold when you have it in. And last of all, there's a, uh, this is an exoskeleton um, made by the Department of Defense. Um, it's on a soldier here. Um, the, the sort of exoskeleton has a computer and a battery pack on the back, and when you wear it, it amplifies your muscle power by 17 times. So, to explore the merging of the human and AI, let's play a game. I like to call it bot or not. And so the game is this. I'm going to show you two, um, two finance, financial stories from the news. Uh, one is written by a human and the other is written by a computer program. And they're both the same story, but they're written by two different uh, entities. So, and I want you to try to guess. I'm going to I'm going to poll you afterwards, see which one you think is the human and which one you think is the computer. So the story number one, I'm going to read it out loud. Denny's Corporation on Monday reported first quarter profit of $8.5 million. The Spartanburg, South Carolina-based company said it had profit of 10 cents per share. The results beat Wall Street expectations. The average estimate of four analysts surveyed by Zach's Investment Research was for earnings of 9 cents per share. The restaurant operator posted revenue of $120.2 million, million in the period, also beating Wall Street forecasts. All right, that's story one. Now story two. Denny's Corporation notched a grand slam of its own in the first quarter, earning a better than expected 10 cents a share as restaurant sales jumped by more than 7%. Operating revenues topped $120 million. Adjusted net income jumped 36% to $8.7 million. Denny's is one of the nation's largest full-service restaurant chains. The growth in sales suggests consumers are opening their pocketbooks for pancakes, eggs, and hash browns. Earnings were also helped by lower costs for raw materials. All right. So how many people think number one was written by a human being? Okay, how many people think number one was written by a computer program. <laughs> you can't raise your hand twice for the same one. <laughs> okay, number, oops, number two, how many people think that was written by a computer program? How many people think it was written by a human being? Okay, so equal number of hands go up for all of these. So in fact, story number one was written by the computer. Story number two was written by a human being. There's only one way I could tell, and it took me a while. Story number two has metaphors built in and creative uh, imagery. Computers can't do that yet. They can do just the facts, ma'am. So you can, if you notice, story one is just facts. All very well written and correct facts, but nothing flashy. Number two, a human being wrote it, and he put a, or she put a few flashes in, like Denny's Corporation notched a grand slam of its own. That's something a computer program wouldn't be able to do because it's a creative play on words. Um, also at the end, the growth in sales suggests consumers are opening their pocketbooks for pancakes, eggs, and hash browns. That kind of imagery is also something a computer program would not do. However, this is a very popular automated program that's used for stories like this. In fact, many of the financial stories you read, as well as the sports stories you read, if they're pretty short, those are written by a program that AP and others use called Wordsmith, and it's been used since 2014. So chances are over the last six years, you've read computer-generated stories, like number one. So futurist predictions about, the let's move to the future. What, what's coming down the pike, according to futurists? Well, one thing is an enhanced visual spectrum by things like that optometric, um, opiometrics, um, uh, bionic cornea, which will make us not only be able to see sharper and better in our regular range, but also in the infrared and ultraviolet ranges. Also faster and better thinking via digital implants in the brain, like those I just talked about. And even immortality via nanobots that can be injected into the blood to fix our things that are wrong in our body and kill diseases by microscopically attacking them at a molecular level because nanobots are tiny, molecular size. Now the thing is about nanobots, this is the one thing that's not very well developed yet, 
this is all, in, that's in theory. In fact, man, nanobots can't do much yet. So that's one that's probably not, um, it's very speculative. And the last thing is, talking animals um, via digital enhancement, such as enhancing their voice box. Uh, for instance, chimpanzees can communicate already with humans using deaf sign language. In fact, Washoe, um, who some of you may have heard of, now, now deceased, um, she could talk with human beings that had, I think, a vocabulary of about four to 600 words in deaf sign language, um, and she could communicate quite clearly. So the idea of people that want to enhance animals is you would just put a, a they, bonobos and, and apes can't speak because their vocal cords aren't built for it. So if you give them bionic vocal cords and maybe alter um, a part of their brain to enhance the speech center, they could. And that's what some people would like to do. Predicted future implants. Um, I have a, a graphic up here that shows some of them. One is um, uh, tiny implants, um, electronic gold skin and tiny implants between skin cells to enable a direct link with uh, digital devices. Wireless branded device interaction, which we've talked about. Um, perfect replaceable teeth. Um, and a multifunctional health monitor with automatic insulin dispersion for diabetics. Now they're showing on the, on the screen um, sort of metallic implants, copper implants in the hand and a wrist device for injecting the insulin. But we already have, this is a couple years old and I'm already wearing a Fitbit and the new Apple Watches can do a lot of those um, health checking things. Um, they don't inject insulin or alter anything, but that it's just a matter of degree. Uh, a few years, they'll probably be able to do that too. Right now, insulin, insulin, um, automatic insulin pumps are implanted in the stomach, but they run with a device that looks a lot like a small iPhone. And last of all, electronic muscle support tights, which are an offshoot of the exoskeletons I showed you. So just one, one artist's imaginary picture of a post-human looks a lot like RoboCop, if you ever saw that movie. It's a half robot and half human face. That's Ian Pearson. But humans, post-humans may not look like this. People with implants would look just like me. Um, I, if I had a brain implant, like a Wi-Fi antenna in there, and, I could, and, I, and some software or nodes that could communicate with digital devices outside my body, I could have already you know, plan my next year's worth of, of writing while I'm talking to you. So, some concerns of thinkers about this stuff. Ethicists. First concern is we won't pay attention to how we're being affected, transformed by our increasing dependence on machines. And this was a big concern of Lee Adler's, um, according to um, what the critics said and what Adler himself said, and, and you can see it in his paintings, as I'll show you in a, a little bit. Um, so he anticipates this. Um, this is a concern that's big right now, but he was already thinking about this back in the 70s and 60s. So how aware are we really about our extreme interaction with machines? What kinds of technology dependence do we already have well, first of all, I've shown you instances of physical um, dependency and economic dependency. We're depending more and more on machines in the, in the first world to produce our goods. And in fact, it's putting a lot of people out of jobs or at least making their jobs more vulnerable. Um, for instance, um, I can't show you the statistics now because I don't have time, but um, one of the job categories that's in danger of being extinct in the next 10 years is accounting because already tax accounts, my tax accountant uses software that does most of the numbers crunching for him. So what, what does he, he, he's changed though to make himself marketable. He spends more of his time hand holding and, and telling me how to you know, deal with tax law rather than crunching the numbers. I could do that with TurboTax. Um, so the predictions are, some gloomy economists are, pick, are, are predicting that accountants may, as a, a job, may be extinct within 10 years. But what about emotional connection and dependence? People may not realize it, but we, that's the new big thing is social robotics and um, forming 
People at, for instance, the MIT Media Lab are studying, led by Cynthia Brazil, are, are studying ways to, um, to make humans feel empathy for robots and have robots that at least simulate empathy well enough to make attachments with humans. Let's go back to the Roomba first. This is a Roomba on the screen. It looks like a big discus. Um, like I said, I have two of them. They work great. But I don't particularly feel a connection to this robot. All it does is vacuum my floor. It doesn't talk to me. Um, it doesn't uh, do anything, uh, really, except vacuum. However, even with that, humans are vulnerable to, to making connections and attachments. There are people like these on the screen who dress up, they love the Roomba, and they dress up as Roombas for Halloween. Or they buy costumes for their Roombas. This one, <laughs> this, this robot has a costume of a leopard skin with two eyes on it, so it looks like a little cat running around the floor. Now, you may think this is funny, but um, some research into this shows that people can actually inconvenience themselves at the least by attaching themselves to a Roomba um, or a robot that has no feelings because um, it doesn't care back. And, and by the way, it goes beyond just buying costumes. Some people in studies actually give their Roombas a day off because they're so grateful that these Roombas do the vacuuming for them. Well, a, a robot doesn't need a day off, right? And they don't care if they have a day off. But these people, they see the robot as a, a person instead of a thing. Think, you may think this is silly and, and impossible, but how many of you named your cars when, at some point in your life, right? How many of you name other devices? Oh, come on, Zelda, blend this, this milkshake for me. Um, don't quit on me now. I talk to my car, right? You turn in the crank, crank in the engine, it, it's not starting. You start going, come on, come on, please, don't do this to me. It doesn't listen. So here's some social robots that are um, now in prototype, and some of them are on sale. This one's a nice fuzzy little dinosaur. Um, and uh, this, this is a baby harp seal robot used in Japan um, mainly um, for therapy for um, people with Alzheimer's. It, I've, I've held this thing. It wiggles around, it's fuzzy, it's white, and it coos when it's in your hands. So it's really cute. Um, and then there's this thing called the Geminoid, invented by a Jap Japanese roboticist named Hiroshi Ishiguro. And um, I've actually met the guy and held this Geminoid. It's again supposed to be therapeutic for people who have Alzheimer's or who are elderly and lonely. I find it creepy. <clears throat> it has rubbery skin and it has little stumpy, really stumps as arms and legs and it wiggles them when it's in your hands and it sort of wheels around. Um, it doesn't have any warmth built into it and has hard little bodies that wiggles and then somebody behind a screen talks to you um, in, invisibly so that it sounds like you're talking to uh, another human. The most advanced social robot right now is Pepper. Um, you, on the screen, you can see an example of Pepper. Um, it talks, it's built simply, the whole purpose is to make you feel good. And it'll, it's about four feet tall, white, looks, has childlike face, and it'll talk to you, tell you jokes, have a conversation with you, and it can tell what your mood is because it has video cams as eyes and, and it has optical recognition capability, and then it has, it processes your facial expressions and the tone of your voice, and um, then it determines what your mood is, and it tries to change it if it's bad. If it's a good mood, it tries to enhance it. So I've met one of these peppers. They're bought, um, they're sold by a Japanese company, but there's some around the United States. My local mall has one at the Nike store. Uh, to get people to come in. So I talked to Pepper at my Nike store. Sometimes these, these attempts to make social AI can backfire. Here's an example of one. This is again a Japanese. The Japanese have made most of the humanoid social robots. The reason, they're running out of children. Um, they don't have people to take care of the elderly, so they're trying to find a way to make humanoid robots that are fuzzy and warm and, and friendly enough so that they can work with the elderly in um, homes and so forth. So let me show you why this is, my students find this very creepy. One is real, the, the and the other is fake. Uh, 
excuse the counterfeit devices today. A YouTube problem. So this is the robot. It has rubbery gray skin. Um, it has eyes that look humanoid. And it, it has only three fingers and no hair. And it was invented to study the development of toddlers, human toddlers. So it's supposed to be like a human toddler. This is what creeps my students out the most. It has the movements are like some kind of human that's in trouble here. It's sort of flopping around on the ground. Hand. Also, it's, <laughs> it's vocalizations, it's hands, the skin. So um, I think you get the idea there. Some further questions all this raises. Um, are we inappropriately offloading human responsibilities to technology? And these things show up in Adler's work as well. He anticipates this. Um, are we warping the nature of what's real, real emotion, real relationships, real experience? Adler also asked those questions according to uh, things I've read about him. Let me um, go to what artists do. Artists of various types are broaching these questions today. So um, one, of, one example is Cecil B. Evans. Um, this is a, on screen is one of his art pieces. It's a 22 minute video that's a loop that constantly um, uh, and automatically randomly generates different conversations from this now dead actor on screen that's being represented by a 3D um, animation. And then weird things happen in the background like jellyfish floating by or fish or just random objects. And then you never know what's going to happen next. And the name of the, of the piece is Hyperlinks or It Didn't Happen, which is an interesting reflection of this artist on social media of today. Um, so that's one way he used, he used technology to reflect on how technology affects us. Same with the current literary and cinematic art. Here's some examples, Terminator 3, um, as part of the Terminator series, was a reflection by cinematic artists on our relationship with technology, especially intelligent technology. Same with Ex Machina, came out a few years ago. And Blade Runner, a couple of movies. One just came out a couple of years ago. And The Matrix, in which we basically live in a simulated environment that's generated by an AI. And of course, these are all really problematic movies the themes of all of them is the threat of, of handing over too much control to smart machines. But those preoccupations started a long time ago, in the early 20th century, and artists started thinking about them then too. Uh, for instance, some of it's dystopian, not very nice. RUR, which is short for Rosam's Universal Robots, a play from 1920. Also, Metro Metropolis, 1927, Fritz Lang's classic silent movie, and Charlie Chaplin's 1936 movie, Modern Times. Um, you can see in the visuals here, um, the robot in, in Fritz Lang's movie, uh, Metropolis, was a central character. And she starts as a female android that starts a rebellion against um, factory owners. In, Modern times, you can see in the, the classic, classic film freeze frame um, that was part of the advertisement for it, Chaplin is caught in the gears of a factory while he's trying to fix one of the wheels. And in RUR, how many people know about RUR, by the way? It's kind of obscure. Um, RUR was the first robot story. In fact, it is written by a Czech um, writer named Karl Čapek. And Čapek actually invented the word robot. It, it's from the Czech word robota, which is Czech for slave or worker. And um, the story is basically about humans inventing a, a whole race of robots as slaves. And um, they make them too intelligent and human-like. And the robots realize they're strong enough to be the masters, and they kill the whole human race. Um, and this is 1920. Um, some of the work back then was whimsical and sort of celebrated um, automation and machines. 
A good example of that is the Russian constructivist work in the art world. This is a, uh, an example by Alexandra Exter in 1922, a Russian artist. And you can see elements of architecture mixed with humans and some vaguely industrial machinery. And then um, Suka, who's Polish in 1925, has this painting which incorporates humans and machines together in the same painting. And, so, and some, some way this head, the human head, is blended into um, the whole mishmash, a sort of pastiche. Adler blends both of these. So Adler draws, his work draws from uh, Russian constructivist work, or it reflects it um, in its celebration, in its style and its celebration of um, automation and machines, but it also questions how much we rely on the machines and how much, uh, how dangerous machines may be, especially as we get further along in time. This preoccupation grows in the, 20th, the mid 20th century, which is when Lee Adler was working. So here's some examples of the kind of thing he was surrounded by um, that pondered the possibilities of uh, machines. 2001, A Space Odyssey. How many people remember HAL, the computer, that controlled the lives of all the astronauts on that spaceship and killed most of them? Westworld, the movie, not the TV show. How many people, anybody see Westworld besides me when it came out? Pretty scary. Yul Brenner playing an evil robot that somehow goes rampant in a Disney-like environment and starts killing human beings. Um, and it's supposed to be a gunslinger that that dies every day. Um, the Stepford Wives, anybody see that? You know, a lot of people. Um, so you all know that story. And Blade Runner, which came out around when Lee Adler stopped painting, but still in the ballpark um, with Harrison Ford as a, as a bounty hunter called a Blade Runner, whose job it is to catch robots that have, or not robots, but androids that have come back to Earth from their off-world um, domiciles. And he kills them because it's against the law. It's a, it's a death penalty for any android found on Earth. Why? Because they're slaves. And that the fact they're on Earth means that they have killed a human being. I don't know what's going on with the computer here. <laughs> Suddenly a program is taking over. It, a bot. It's a bot. It's well, I'll go back and... Uh, let's see, hit the escape button. Yeah, this is a demonstration of exactly what I'm talking about. So let's even get back to where I was. All right, so meanwhile, in the real life mid 20th century, we. You know, Adler was surrounded by these kinds of things, the factory, car factory, pacemakers, which were invented in 1958 and could be implanted in the human body, as well as the iron lung. Even the iron lung was used, it's still used for two people are left on iron lungs that were invented in the 40s because they're elderly people who were suffered from um, polio um, back before there was a vaccine for it. They had to live inside these machines and it, it's kind of interestingly similar to the, some of the paintings Adler has where the machine absorbs the human. Hang on just a sec. Rebooting. Okay. So Lee Adler is an early artistic commentator on our present digital world, but he was also surrounded by a burgeoning digital world himself. Um, he blends constructivist symmetry, celebration of modern technology. As one critic said during his lifetime, in his work, Adler celebrates the beauty he sees in the symmetries and order of our high-tech society. But he also had skepticism about machine-human relations <clears throat> that were akin to the skepticism in the, in the films and literature I just showed you. Once one critic said, in Adler's world, we're in a race to stay human, and the machines seem to be winning. So let's look at uh, just some examples here. I picked some examples that are right next to each other and sort of a, a blend, uh, sort of a lineage. 
This one here in 1972, and there's going to be a progression all the way through uh, the early 70s here. He has what, what looks to me like a combination of human and duck, um, but it's kind of a machine. And inside of it, in its belly, if you look closely, it's a vaguely humanoid shape. The head is up there at the top, a vague nose and head, and a blob of a body inside. <clears throat> And that gets next, the year after, in his uh, piece called Gears 8 in 1973, you see the humans embedded in the machine even more clearly. Um, you see up at the very top of the, top of the painting, or the print, a human head and shoulders, two of them, one upside down to the other. And then inside, down further, you see a human head that's very clearly a human head, screaming, inside of another human head. And all of that is mixed in with the gears and, and works of a machine. That gets clarified even more the next, in the next one, figure nine, in the same series. You can see more clearly the human head in the middle with the scream, and another head inside of that one with the scre bigger scream, and they're all inside of a human head with its mouth closed, which is all inside of a machine. Then the next year, he paints one where the human isn't inside the machine or absorbed by the machine, it is the machine. This is a reclining figure, 1974, and you see here a, 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 an abstract human head and body leaning up against a wall, and <clears throat> the head and body are made of what looks like a, they look like a schematic for um, a bunch of circuit boards put together as some sort of electronic machine. And the last one I want to show, the next year red figure, is even a more horrific <laughs> depiction of human become machine in an abstract form. You can see what looks to me like the mouth of a human, the mandible and maxilla. And on the upper side, the maxilla, the dentures or the teeth look like they're made of chips of some kind or circuit boards. And it's gobbling up what looks like another circuit board inside of its big, capacious mouth, um, and it's bright red. I found that one the scariest uh, for me. And I'm going to stop here, and I hope this launches you into um, sort of a, a nice um, visit of, with the rest of the paintings here in the exhibition. And um, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have at this point. Thank you, thank you. My inconclusive conclusion. Um, does anybody have, yeah, in the back. Do you know much about how familiar he was with science fiction? That would be a better question for the curator who knows much more about his life. I'm more an expert in the technology and culture part. Uh, Ksenia, do you, could you answer that? More hands. During your studies, did you come across anything about uh, cure for spinal cord injuries? Yes. Um, the, the big hope for that right now is those exoskeletons. They've made a lighter version of them, more portable. They call it an exosuit. And if you look on, um, if you just Google uh, exosuit par paralysis, you'll see videos of people uh, wearing prototypes made by companies that are making them specifically for people with paralysis. Um, there was also a recent article in the New York Times on the neurological end <clears throat> that uh, uh, scientists have managed to find some sort of um, nerve that they've been able to work with and regenerate to some extent, but that's still a long way off. Mainly it's the exosuits for now.
and I, and I was trying to say that if he was aware of it or not, his paintings at least reflect the cultural moment of, of his time. Yes, you're expressing the exact sentiments of the transhumanists. They, 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 want, they see it as, they see that eventually we'll live in a utopia where automation, automated machines, intelligent machines, will do all of this, the scut work for us and create all of our food and, and clothing and everything else, and we'll have a lot of leisure time to devote to other pursuits like philosophy, painting, and so forth. Um, but I'm skeptical of that because think about just think about the desktop computer. Um, did, think about how you use it at work. Is it a labor saver? I say it's a labor creator because as soon you, we are all, I'm able to write an article much faster with a computer because I can do uh, instant searches. I can write much faster. I can edit much faster. But does that mean my boss is going to let me sort of go off and, and meditate? I don't think so. <laughs> She's going to give me more work to fill in those, those uh, spaces. So I think the danger is that what spare time we create with our automation is not really given to us um, as spare time. And that echoes a big concern of um, econ economists and ethicists who are worried about job, the death of jobs because of automation, that people have, it's, if you give them money to live, that doesn't make them happy because they have nothing to do. Um, some, a lot of us define ourselves by the work we do. And if, they t if you take that away, you have nothing to define yourself with. So it, this has been a big problem with people losing jobs in factories because of automation. Um, yeah, they could retool and retrain, but maybe their brain doesn't work that way, or, or maybe they just they love working with their hands and now they can't do it anymore um, because a machine does their job. So that's a very interesting question, and it's up for debate right now. Um, more people, yeah. I can't remember their names. I actually met the vice presidential candidate because <laughs> they're so obscure. Um, I could Google it, or one of you could Google it. Just tr Google transhumanist presidential candidate, and his name will pop up. He, he gets on radio shows and stuff around the United States, but they tend to be fringe shows. Um, I don't mean to, be, to laugh at him, but um, his sole platform is we have to change ourselves and make our, incorporate more technology to, to make ourselves evolve so that we're more survivable. One of the things transhumanists are really big on doing is uploading our minds into a robotic body would be ideal for them because then you wouldn't have to breathe, eat, sleep, and you would be able to emigrate to outer space without any problem. I hear the laughs, but this is serious. They, they say there's no way that we're going to survive on this planet as we are, and we can't get off the planet as we are, so we need to transform ourselves um, so we can get off this planet. That's one of their platform pieces. Yep.
yeah, Andrew Yang is, or Yang is, is sympathetic with transhumanist views in a lot of ways. Um, he's a much more mainstream candidate, though. Um, yeah. You mean, you mean these things? <laughs> yeah, I, I've, I, I work with a bunch of, we have a cybersecurity program at my school and the people I work with say the same thing you do. Also, most of them are much more skeptical about the future power of AI than people like general population are. Um, they tell me, you know, the idea of uploading your mind into a robot is probably impossible and even, Speaking of Google, um, Ray Kurzweil, who's the head of Google Research now, is one of the guys that talks about uploading your mind into a, a robot, and he's convinced, he calls it the singularity, that we will um, have AI, what's called artificial general intelligence and AI that's as intelligent as human beings or better within 30 years. And most computer scientists I talk to say that's ridiculous. It will take at least 200 years. We need a different substrate because all we have is silicon right now. Silicon chips are too crowded already. The end of packing stuff on silicon chips is near and there's no other substrate. There's quantum, I'm getting too wonky here, but let me just stop here. There's, there's quantum computing, but it doesn't work very well and there's only three prototypes. So. Nothing, am I wrong? There's nothing really realistic down the pike to make more powerful AI than what we have. Right. But yeah, if what you're saying is very completely true to me that um, modern hardware does not afford that kind of exponential takeoff. And I actually asked him this question. I asked him this question at a conference like, uh, yeah. like this, yeah. and his excuse was, well, we have quantum computing coming down the pike. So it was kind of a hand waving. So, um, but let's get into some less wonky stuff here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so augmented reality and virtual reality is being used in its infancy now in education, um, educational technology. It's still really at the beginning, it's Wild West, you know. I'm part of a, I'm part of a group, a meetup group in Manhattan with a bunch of startup corporations who are doing this stuff, making virtual reality um, educational packages or, or device games, really, a lot of them. And so uh, my partner and I, my research partner and I, noticed that there's really nothing for the humanities, especially at the university level. It's all for people in the science, technology, engineering, and math programs. Um, so we decided, you know, Shakespeare is very difficult. We both teach Shakespeare and have taught it for a long time. Students have a, a hard time with the culture, um, the history, the language, but the, if you know more about the culture and history, 
that could help students. So we created a game. We have a prototype um, called Perchance. It's a game uh, where students try to solve the mystery of who actually killed Hamlet's father, if anybody. So that's a way to get them introduced to the play. They play the game first and encounter the major questions while they play the game, come back and we discuss, the teachers discuss in class what they found. They write a little bit in the game too. Um, so it starts the whole process, the, the learning process, and then hopefully kicks it off. So we're just testing it now um, and talking about it. I don't talk about that enough, I guess. I, We've done it, we programmed it in a, in a code called Unity and we are able to, pr we're able to tweak it so it comes out either as augmented reality, which I'll t explain in a second, or virtual reality where you have to wear goggles, um, or as a 2D video game. We've tested it on students, college students. They don't like the VR. There's too many pieces of equipment. It's too expensive. It's hard to, for a classroom to buy all that stuff. It takes a while to set up. So that's a problem. Um, they don't, we thought augmented reality would be perfect because you can, augmented reality, you, I use my camera here and I point it at the floor. We built Elsinore Castle with a village and the way it works is they load it on their phone, they move their phone like this and the village appears through the camera projected on the floor and then you can make the village bigger and walk through the village with your, by using your phone. All right, the problem with that, we thought we were so cool, and then we tried it on the students, and they said, it killed my battery within five minutes. Because <laughs> it takes up, it's a real resource hog. So we went back to the drawing board, and now we have it on 2D um, on a computer. Students also, the other problem we found is students really hate sharing their phones. And we thought, well, this is great. We'll have the equipment in the classroom, because most students have a phone or a tablet. And so the few students who didn't, we said, well, could you share with them? And nobody wanted to let somebody else touch their phone. So that was another problem. So we're, go we're, we're looking at uh, making a 2D version that we can just use on classroom computers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, Actually, that's a, it's called Evergene. I'm going to check that one out because there, there are some programs, some VR programs that have tried to tackle um, the humanities and, and, and literature, but not very many. Um, we actually didn't want to build a game. We wanted to study the effectiveness of these games for education, and we looked around and there was nothing. So, so we had to build one. So now I'm now a game builder and talking about things like coding in Unity, um, which I know is gibberish for probably most people, so I apologize. What are the differences between us and robots and AI? Yeah. Any advances You mean for robots? No. Ah, yeah. I'm trying to think. Well, there are experiments with installing um, a type of like the BCI was, uh, sorry, the brain computer interfaces I was talking about before um, with implanting Wi-Fi and what they have now is wired stuff. So there's two ways those, B it's called BCI by scientists, there's two ways it works. One is incoming and the other is outgoing, right? So people have used BCI, I'm sure you've seen videos of this on TV. Um, people who are paralyzed, quadriplegics who can work a robotic arm with their, head, with their mind, um, they, they have um, an implement implanted in their brain that sends outgoing impulses translated by a computer. There's the incoming, like the ones I talked about for epileptics and um, Parkinson's patients. So they're using that kind of thing to put in parts of the brain to try to control other things like pain. Um, they've, they're using it somewhat problematically, I should say, to help try to help people with depression um, or obsessive compulsive disorder, but it's causing some problems uh, because it tends to alter their personality in certain ways as well. So it's that domino thing. You alter one thing and it 
alters a bunch of other things in your brain. We don't understand the brain very well yet. So pain is wrapped up in that, I guess. But there's not, I don't know personally of a lot of things going on with that. Yes. In fact, I'm going to give a talk on that in Serbia in about th three months. There's a whole conference about a bioethicists. I'm, I'm one. Um, sort of the technology, technology ethics and bioethics blend where you, when you start using digital devices to implant in humans and alter the, uh, humans with other types of science. So pharmaceuticals is another avenue that um, transhumanists hope to use to alter humans. What the, <clears throat> excuse me, what the conference is about is enhancing morality with science, human morality, by altering pieces of the brain or the seat of, of morals. There's a, there's a guy at Oxford University named Julian Savalescu, and he is proposing that there's a, an enzyme that's naturally present in the body called oxytocin. And it, for instance, it's emitted when you have bonding experiences. For instance, just after a woman has a baby, her body's flooded with oxytocin, and it causes her to feel strong uh, affection for the baby and bond with the baby. Because um, it's a very painful experience, so it's a kind of an adaptive thing, right? So Savalescu proposes we should have a pharmaceutical company reverse engineer oxytocin and then spray it in the air ambiently, this is no joke, spray it in the air ambiently, especially at international meetings of uh, politicians, <laughs> to force them to be more kind and gentle to each other and to trust each other more so that they would negotiate in good faith. I'm not so happy about this proposal, by the way. <laughs> I'm going I'm, I'm to be arguing against it, I think, in my talk. Why? Well. For instance, one of the easy reasons is pharmaceuticals don't affect everybody the same way. Um, it, think about people taking in a drink, you know, a martini. That one martini could affect five of you five different ways. So if you have 20 people in a room negotiating inhaling oxytocin, there might be some people who are fairly immune to it um, or it doesn't affect them as much. They'll be like foxes in the hen house. That's, that's one reason. Another reason has to do with free will. Um, I'm not so sure there is a such, such a thing as free will based on neuroscience, but um, one philosophical stance against um, it, forcing people to have to ingest or take moral enhancers is that you're forcing them, um, and humans should have a choice. Uh, <laughs> Well, I won't get into politics, but um, uh, what Savalescu says is it's a matter of survival. He says, look, our planet is on the verge of planetary death. We have climate change problems. We have people shooting at each other. We have nuclear weapons. If we don't, as humans, behave more civilly toward each other, we're not going to survive. And he says, this is an emergency, and desperate measures are required, and this is one, use pharmaceuticals to make everybody feel great, and then they'll all be nicer to each other. Basically, have everybody get high on oxytocin, <laughs> and they'll be much, much less, you know, irritable. Well, they have oxytocin too. Yeah. All right, how are we doing on time here? I'd be happy to answer questions afterwards if anybody wants, but I think we're, uh, we're. Thank you.